أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآله محمد عظم الله أجورنا وأجوركم بمصابنا بأبي عبد الله الحسين Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa Just to cover what we've been talking about since the beginning of this program, we spoke about the importance of having a mission and the importance of having a vision. Then we spoke about the mission and the vision of Imam al Hussein sallallahu alayhi in Karbala. And we covered uh, how the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should live in this life in order for them to reform or to be part of the reformation movement. We said how they should walk and deal with people and how they should spread words of peace. Uh, tonight, inshallah, we want to continue with this discussion to see the characteristics of the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what are the main characteristics for those who wish to reform or those who should reform according to the Quran? And we'll try to end the lecture with applying it with some practical examples. The first uh, characteristic that is important for us to have in order to be successful in our movement and in anything we want to do in life is maturity, to be mature. Maturity in its religious context it refers to the awakening of the fitrah, awakening of the nature. As we mentioned previously, all the knowledge that you want in this life, all the knowledge that you seek in this life exists within. It exists within you. The Prophet ﷺ were sent to teach you or to give you an opportunity to find these treasures or to recognize these treasures so they can uh, give you a chance in order for you to find these treasure, treasures that exist inside of you or as Amir al-Mu'min alayhi salam says أَتَحْسَبُ أَنَّكَ جُرْمٌ صَغِيرٌ وَفِيكَ انْطَوَ الْعَالَمُ الْأَكْبَرُ You think that you're a small creature or that physical body and inside you the whole uh, treasures or the whole secrets of this universe exist. Everything that Allah created, is in, all the knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created is inside of you. And you are the center of this existence. When it comes to the possible existence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, you are the center of this existence. And even when it comes to religion, some people they are they have this discussion, what is the most important thing in religion? Some people, they argue that the most important thing in religion is religion itself. In the sense that people or religious people should be there to serve religion. And we always use this in our terms, that I'm here to serve my religion. But from a philosophical and the Quranic perspective, the center or the main uh, thing in religion is the person himself or the human being himself. You are the center of this religion. Religion was sent for, for, for it to serve you and not the other way around. Allah sent his rulings, Allah sent his uh, divine revelation to serve the human beings, to help us out, to remove us from our difficulties, to solve our problems. This all can be understood through maturity. And this is the first level for anyone who wants to reform. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا So direct your face towards religion. Follow this religion. What is this religion? He says, it is the truth that exists inside your fitrah. This is the religion of Allah. Submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this knowledge of submitting exists inside of you. Through your fitrah, through your nature, you can recognize uh, good from wrong. You can recognize, for example, that it is good to help uh, the poor people. It's good to help uh, those who are oppressed. Uh, you recognize that, for example, stealing is wrong. 
helping an old lady or an, or, or an old man is a good thing. You don't wait for a religion or you don't have to wait for a religion to come and tell you there's a ruling that you have to be good to people. This is something that your fitrah tells you, your nature tells you this. You don't have to wait for a prophet to teach you this. This is why when it comes to some of the uh, rulings in Islam, we reach them through what we refer to as, uh, to as al-mustaqillat al-aqliyyah. Yani through logical evidence, without the need of having a narration and without the need of having a verse. It comes from the nature. This is the first step that a great prophet like Ibrahim alayhi salam followed in order for him to reform in his nation or in his community. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he sp speaks about Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, he says, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ رُشْدَهُ And we have certainly given Ibrahim alayhi salam his sound judgment or maturity in the sense that he understood or he was open to his nature and he understood the secrets of his nature. He stood, Ibrahim as the Quran mentions, إِذْ قَالَ لِأَبِيهِ وَقَوْمِهِ مَا هَذِهِ التَّمَاثِيلُ الَّتِي أَنْتُمْ لَهَا عَاكِفُونَ When he said to his father, referring to his uncle Azar and his people, what are these idols that you worship? Ibrahim, from his nature or through his nature, he recognized that it is it, it is wrong to worship or to take a man-made idol as a god. This was done to him not through a revelation. This was done, or he understood this before the revelation came down to him. And before he was appointed as a prophet, he understood that through his nature, through the fitrah. The same thing when it comes to the movement of Abi Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. When Imam al Hussein alayhi salam went out to Karbala, it was not only based on an inspiration. You know, when you say revelation, revelation is limited to prophets. Those besides prophets, they receive inspiration or they are inspired. It was not, his movement was not based on inspiration. It was not based on the unseen only. It was, it, it, but rather, it was based on the knowledge that he had in his nature, in his fatra. From his nature, he knew that it is wrong to stay silent in front of the oppression that was taking place back then. Through his nature and through his intellect, Imam al Hussein understood that there's a big danger on Islam if we stay quiet at that time. So he stood out and he went to Karbala. The same thing for us today. If we want to be successful in anything we want to do in life, whether it's on a religious level or on a personal level, you have to be mature. You have to be mature in order for you to succeed. The second uh, characteristic is insight. And insight, I think we spoke uh, enough about insight or having a vision in other terms in our previous nights. But there's a nice hadith, um, very interesting hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, Rahimallahu abdan arafa min ayna wa ila ayna wa fi ayn. May Allah have mercy on a servant who knows where he came from, where is he now, and where he is going. Where do you come from, where, do you, where, where are you now, and where you are going? These are very important questions that you have to ask yourself. In other words, you have to know, <coughs> you have to reflect on history, you have to uh, comprehend the present that you're living in, and you have to think and plan for the future. This is from, from where, where are you, and to where you are going. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He says, Ya ayyuhal insanu innaka kadihun ila rabbika kathan fa you are uh, <coughs> working or walking in this path and you will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will meet Allah. Meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it can be achieved in this life before the hereafter. Of course, when we speak about meeting Allah, we don't uh, refer to a physical meeting with Allah because we don't believe that Allah has a physical body. But in a spiritual sense, a believer can meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this life before the hereafter. 
You don't have to wait for the hereafter to meet Allah. And you don't have to wait for the hereafter to know who are the people of paradise and who are the people of hellfire. You can find them today. The people of hell exist and the people of paradise exist today. Those who oppress people, those who kill uh, people around the world, those who invade countries, those who cause harm to others, they are the people of hell. Those who are good, those who are kind, those who spread um, peace and mercy, they are the people of paradise. And the same thing with meeting Allah. When you walk according to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you base all your actions on the commands of Allah and the teachings of Allah, it means that you are meeting Allah in this life. Or you are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this life. We all started from one place, from Allah, in the sense that He's the main cause for this existence, for all possible existence. And we are walking in this journey to reach our final destination, which is the hereafter. Whether we know it or not, we have, we have to walk in this journey. Whether we have a vision or not, we still have to walk in this journey. Whether you're a Muslim, whether you're a non-Muslim, whether the, you're an atheist, you have to walk this journey. No one can choose not to stop walking this journey. Even those who believe that uh, for them to um, escape from this life, they commit suicide. Okay? They say, I want to end my life. No, they end their life in this world, but their life will continue in the year after. You can't escape from this journey. You have to reach the final destination. If you are smart, you need to have a plan to know how to reach your final destination and meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a sound heart, as we spoke about in previous nights, in order for you to benefit from the rewards uh, in, in, in the hereafter. And again, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, in Karbala, he had this plan, he worked at least at least 10 years before Karbala planning for the movement that took place uh, in, in Karbala. The third characteristic is guidance. Um, sometimes you hear or you read a book, you hear a lecture, you hear some information and you benefit from them. Uh, you hear different topics, different views about the same topic, and you get lost. You don't know who is wrong and who is right. What I'm talking about tonight, what the Sayyid spoke about before me, maybe if you invite another speaker, he would speak in a different way, and he will present a different view. Type. How should we distinguish what is right and what is wrong? Here comes the importance of being guided. You need to be guided. You need someone to guide you in everything you want to do in life. Well, from your, your early age, as a, child, as a child, you need your parents to guide you. When you go to school, you need your teacher to guide you. When you go to university, you need your, also your professor to guide you. When you start working outside, you need someone, an expert, to, to guide you on, on how to work. When it comes to religion, the same thing. You need someone to guide you. It's not enough to just read. There's a, uh, there's a famous saying in Arabic, I was saying it last night to some of the brothers, it says, man, it's not a hadith, just a saying. It says, man kana, kit, man kana ustaduhu kitabuhu kathura khata'uhu wa qalla sawabuhu. The one who takes his a book as his teacher, he will fall into a lot of uh, wrong, wrong views. Because you need someone to guide you in, able, in order for you to understand what you read, in order for you to comprehend what you are, what you are reading. And this is why perhaps we have the concept of marja'iya in the Shia school of thought. And this is why if you look at the hadith, for example, the hadith of, uh, that uh, advises us to follow the marja, it says, أَمَّا الْحَوَادِثُ الْوَاقِعَ فَرْجِعُوا بِهَا Return back to the narrators of our narrations. 
The Imam didn't say return back to our narrations. Because sometimes if you return back to the narration, you get lost which narration to take, which one to accept, which one to reject. He said return back to the narrators of our, of our narrations. Return back to those who can guide you in the, in the knowledge. Those who are mature, mature and who are able to present the correct views to you when they speak about, about religion. So uh, this is very important in order to be successful, uh, successful in your life. And subhanAllah, one of the hadith that speaks about the end of time, it says that um, one of the signs of the end of time is for children to sit on the minbar of Rasulullah sallallahu Now when it says children, some people they think it's about the age, and it's not about the age. Because you're not going to have a child sitting down and people listening to him, correct? Yeah, and a child is someone, let's say, under the age of seven, or at the age of five, six, seven. The Prophet he was speaking about the level of intellect about, of the speakers of the end of the time. The level of intellect of these speakers, where they sometimes sit down and they have the level of intellect of a five or a six year old. Once I was I remember like a long time ago, not now, like seven, six, seven years ago, I was mentioning this hadith on the member, and uh, I said one of the signs that children will sit on the member of Rasulullah, one of the crowd stood up and said, SubhanAllah, it's happening because we have a child speaking to us about me. Yeah. So I said to him, and the hadith continues to say that ignorant will accept what he says to them. And you accept. <laughs> By the way, the hadith doesn't, doesn't the hadith doesn't say that. But I just made it up to to respond to him back then. <laughs> so you need someone to guide you with everything you, you you do you do in life. Otherwise, otherwise you you'll get you'll get lost. See, a lot of people during the time of Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam, they were sincere. They were sincere. They loved Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. But with that, they didn't go out with him to Karbala. One of our scholars today, he says that some of the companions back then, they failed to recognize their mission. They didn't have this guidance. They failed to recognize their mission. Some of the companions that we believed, they are pious. Some of the companions that we still, when we mention them, we say, radiyallahu anhu. They didn't go out with Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. For example, I'll give you a name, Kumail ibn Ziyad. Where was Kumail ibn Ziyad? Did he go out with Imam al-Hussein? He did. So some people, they failed to recognize their mission. Why? Because they didn't have maybe perhaps someone to, to guide them to find the truth. As believers, as believers, we seek the guidance of, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us in everything. And Allah, He sends His guidance through His Prophets and through the successors of the Prophets and through Awliyaullah and through the pious scholars who teach us what to do, what, what is wrong and what is right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا And those who strive for us, those who work for our sake, those who work in the path of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we will surely guide them to our ways. You have to take the first step. Take the first step if your intention is for the sake of Allah. Take the first step and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide you. But you have to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In anything you want to do in your life. Believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and let him take care of, uh, of, of the rest. Now, Either you follow this method of having a mission, a plan, and having someone to guide you, to tell you what to do, some, some expert to guide you, or you just do everything you want in this life blindly, without thinking, without thinking. And obviously you will end up failing in most of the things that you want to do. Some people, when they want to ask for guidance, when they want someone to guide them, how do they ask? 
How do they ask? I'll tell you from experience. Most of those who send me a, uh, send me a message, message me or call, when they want to do something, whether to start a new job, whether uh, to buy something, whether to get married and so on, how do they ask for help? They say, can we do an istikhara? This is how they ask. This is the guidance that they want. They want istikhara. Okay. And for everything. Wallahi, sometimes at 4 a.m. I've got people messaging me for, for, for istikhara. Yani, I don't know what, what, what they want at 4 a.m. To, to do at 4 a.m. Istikhara, there's a small place for istikhara in Islam where your intellect stops. And this is the view of Sayyid Muhammad Baqir Sadr. He used to say, as long as you can reach a conclusion through your intellect, you shouldn't do an istikhara. Just the moment or the time that you stop thinking or you can't think of or reach a conclusion, then do an istikhara. And that's yani, very hard to happen when you can't find, find a conclusion. Once, uh, a lady, she, she, she messaged, she said, I want to buy a car. Is the istikhara good? I said, no, it's not good. I made the istikhara, it wasn't good. So she sent me a message, uh, do you know what's wrong with the car? <laughs> I told her, I'm a sheikh, not a mechanic. <laughs> how do, how am I going to know what's wrong with the car? Or they say, you know, you're hiding the knowledge, open the Quran for us and find the name. Well, there's no names in the Quran, there's ayat. They come up with weird stuff. This is how they want to be guided. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he guides us through the divine knowledge of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He guides us through the divine knowledge of the Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam through the pure knowledge of our scholars. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on those who pass and protect the ones who are alive with barakat al salati ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Now, to apply these uh, three characteristics on a practical level, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, we find a verse in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ وَالَّذِينَ اسْتَجَابُوا لِرَبِّهِمْ وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَأَمْرُهُمْ شُورًا بَيْنَهُمْ وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ And those who have responded to their Lord and established play, uh, prayer, not prayer, prayer and whose affairs are determined by consultation among themselves and from what we have provided them they spend. The first, the first lesson is to connect to the unseen and those who have responded to their Lord Connect to the unseen. Fill your heart with submission and love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Away from all formalities. Don't limit your relation to Allah or with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the salat that you perform. Away from all formalities. Have a connection, a special connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what is important. You see... The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, the Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa salam, the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, all the great personalities in history, they were successful due to the strong iman, the strong belief that they had in their heart. Just for the strong iman that they had. Fill your heart with love for Allah, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for it to be considered uh, a sound heart and rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in anything you want to do in life. Allah says, Man yahdillahu fa huwa muhtadi Whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, he is rightly guided. This is where the first characteristic can be applied, maturity. Where you re reach a level of maturity, you rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You say, as they say in, uh, in, in, in Christianity, let it be your will. Whatever you, you want to do, do. I'm working, I'm fulfill, fulfilling my obligation to the, best, to, to the best that I can. And you do the rest, Ya Allah. Have this special connection with Allah. Um, I remember when, during the time of the Hawza, when I was in the Hawza, after I moved from Iran to Lebanon, I used, uh, I used to live in the Hawza, inside. So we used to sleep in the Hawza, in one of the rooms. 
with, uh, with, uh, with another Sayyid, another Sayyid that ended up sacrificing his life for the sake of protecting the shrine of Sayyidina Zainab This uh, Sayyid, he used to put his alarm on, it was only uh, both of us in the room. He used to put his alarm on at 2.30 or 3 a.m. in the morning. He used to wake up, he used to say something and go back to sleep. He didn't use to wake up to do Salatul Layl or to do Dua, nothing. He used to say something and go back to sleep. So I used to wake up and complain about the alarm, to be honest. But I wanted to hear what he says. Once I made sure I hear him properly what he's saying, I heard him waking up, sitting, because we used to sleep on the floor, sitting down and saying just one, one sentence. He used to say, I love you, Ya Allah, and then go back to sleep. And not even in formal Arabic. He used to say in Lebanese Arabic, he used to say, Habbak Ya Allah, that's it, that's it. And he used to go back to sleep. I don't know if he used to wake up for Salat al or not, Rahmatullah uh, now. And he ended up yani, receiving this level of shahada. Just for having this special connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the first lesson. The second lesson is to behave in a correct manner. Allah says what means in this verse and establish prayer. They establish prayer. You see, establishing prayer is different than performing prayer. Anyone can perform salat. But establishing prayer means to meet the conditions of salat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna salata tanha an al wal munkar. Salat, prayer, it helps you to stay away from immorality and wrongdoing. How much does our salat keep us away from immorality or from wrongdoing? Sometimes you pray and you think about wrong things that you want to do after Salat. Or well, sometimes even when you want to do something wrong, you say, oh, let's pray and then I'll do the wrong, the, the, the wrong thing after. Or something that is immoral after the Salat. Okay. So uh, there's a difference between establishing and performing. Not everyone who stands in Salat receives the outcome of the Salat or his Salat is accepted. Look in Karbala. Before both army went out to the battlefield, they stood and they prayed. Imam al-Hussein was standing and praying, and Umar ibn Sa'ad was standing and praying. And maybe some of the people with Umar ibn Sa'ad, they had uh, beautiful voices more than the companions of Imam al-Hussein I can tell you, Shimr alayhi Allah, he had a beautiful, more, a, be a beautiful voice than, uh, let's say, John, the companion of Imam al-Hussain. John. <laughs> and Shimmer, he used to know about the Quran more than John. He used to know how to recite the Quran, he used to know, he memorized the Quran, he was a scholar, a Shimmer. And John, he didn't know maybe the basic stuff, the stuff in Islam. But because he recognized the truth and his nature pushed him to stand with the truth. Imam al-Hussain, he told John, he said to him, you are from Africa, you are not even a Muslim. So go your way, you don't have to stand with me, you don't have to support me. He said, no, you, you were good with me. And I'm not going to leave you in that moment. He stood with Imam Musa John, who maybe know nothing about Islam at that moment, he established Salat. And Shimmer, who memorized the Quran, he didn't know how to establish the Salat. The Salat of John was accepted and he received the mercy of Allah. The Salat of Shimmer was rejected and he received the curse of Allah. So there's a big difference between performing and establishing, uh, establishing the Salat. Now, the third lesson that we can learn from this is to have an open mind. To have an open mind. 
Allah says what it means and whose affairs it is determined by consulting among themselves. This is one of the most important steps to have a successful personality. No one from us has the complete truth. No one. Yes, we claim that we follow the complete truth, inshallah, in front of Allah. We say, inshallah, this is what we were able to reach. But on a personal level, no one is infallible for, from us. No one has a divine knowledge. We are, uh, we are all trying to learn as much as possible. And as I said before, we, hum we humbly stand in front of the door of the uh, city of knowledge of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi We're all standing as students trying to learn from the Ahlul Bayt and from, the, from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa so for you to be successful, you can't be arrogant. You can't just rely on your, your personal knowledge that you have. You have to open up. You have to discuss with others. You have to try to benefit from the experiences of, of others. It's not enough to just rely on your own mistakes. It's true that you learn more from your own mistakes, but you don't have enough time. We don't have enough time in this life to just keep doing mistakes and learning from them. It's, it's more wi wise to learn from the mistakes of others. If you see someone doing wrong and you, th and you see how they end, learn from them. There's no need for you to try it in order to see what the outcome is going to be. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal nasu inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu O mankind, indeed we have created you from male and female and made you people and tribes that you may know one another. Knowing one another, it doesn't mean to know the names of one another. Well, how is it gonna how is it's going to benefit me if you know, if I know that your name is, let's say, Ali, if your name is Hassan, or if you know that my name is Nami? What, what benefit is going to make to you? Nothing. It means to benefit from each other, to benefit from the experiences of other people, to benefit from the experiences uh, of others, to open up to the different thoughts, to the different views, to the different schools that you see, and try to, to take what is good from them. I remember once I was reading a book for uh, the late Sheikh Bahjat, and they asked him about a certain personality in, in history, a certain scholar, that there's a debate whether he's Shia or Sunni, because you know, some scholars, there's some debates about them. For example, Ibn Arabi, Sheikh Ibn Arabi, there's a debate whether he's Shia or Sunni, right? Some people, they try to throw him away from each sect, and some people, they try to get him and say, no, he's from us. It depends on the method. Sheikh Bahjad, they ask him, should we accept the teachings of Ibn Arabi or reject it? He said, look, he said to them, now look, it's from me, but he said, we accept everything that goes in line with the Quran and the authentic narrations of the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt. Everything that goes in line with the Quran and the, the Sunnah, the, the narrations of the Prophet, we accept it. Let it be from Ibn Arabi, from Ibn Inglisi, from, from anyone, it doesn't make any difference. And whatever contradicts with the Quran and with the narrations of Rasulullah, we reject it. Even if it comes from a Shia scholar. So it's not about the personality, it's not about who, where they are from, or what school they belong to. No, be open-minded and accept, not accept to listen to, to, to others and benefit from them. Fourth and last step. It's been, it's been a, how long? I'll keep going? He doesn't dare to tell me stop tonight. <laughs> That's why he's keep going. But inshallah, tomorrow I'll promise the lecture will be very short. Tonight, like the last long lecture, inshallah. Okay, so you can remember me inshallah, for the future. The fourth, uh, the, fourth le uh, the fourth lesson is to be generous. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala subhanahu wa ta'ala says, what means and from what we have provided them they spend. And this is a very difficult practical lesson. Some people uh, they keep talking about religion. They keep uh, uh, planning you find them very active in talking but the moment you come and tell them put your hand in your pocket and give us a bit of money they run away 
they escape. It's hard for them, some people, it's hard for them to help out financially. And from experience, I don't know if it's appropriate to say this or not, but yeah, I will say it. Usually those who give the most are those who don't have much money. Ajib. And you find those who don't have enough money, you find them giving more than, more than, more than others. They are more generous. I don't know, maybe because they feel more. Or those who went through more. some difficulties in their lives, you find them, they feel with life, others. But those, for example, who were born rich and those, lived all their life rich, you'll find some, some, good, some, some good people from them. But in general, some of them, they, they find it hard to take uh, it. And this is not new. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi the verse uh, was revealed to him, uh, this verse it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking the Prophet or is revealing to the Prophet to go and ask people for a, re for a reward, for a reward for the message that he came with. So he went to the mosque before reciting the verse. He said to them, Allah revealed to me to ask you to give me a reward for the message that I came with, everyone said why. Everyone said why. They thought that the Prophet is going to ask them for what? For money. They said why. Three times no one replied. The Prophet he said to them, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you for any gold or any silver. It's not, it's not about money. So they stood and said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. Because when they found that their money is going to be safe. Then he said to them, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبِ To show love to, the, to my knee relative. If you want to be successful in your life, you need to be generous. Generosity helps you before it helps others. It helps you to remove from darkness to light. It helps you to remove from selfishness to selfless, to becoming selfless. It helps you to connect to, to your humanity through the humanity of others. And remember that one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al karim the most generous. And his servants must be generous. And who is more generous than Sayyid al-Shuhada, Ali Abdullah al-Husayn alayhi salam, who sacrificed everything he had for the sake of protecting Islam and for the sake of defending Islam. And alhamdulillah today as followers of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi wa salam, we come together every year to commemorate the martyrdom of Abi Abdullah. And alhamdulillah to see all these prog programs that the, that the brother showed us, to see that there's programs going on throughout the year. Inshallah you get all together as a community and you support each other and you support this group as much as you can in order for you to join the caravan of Abi Abdullah alayhi salam. As-salamu alayka Sayyidi wa mawlaya Abi Abdullah al-Husayn wa ala al-arwah al-lati halla fi finaika wa ala akhar fi rahlika عليكم مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وما بقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد من زيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين والسلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته